Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Atheist Alliance International. I'm Jason Sylvester, aka Diogenes of Mayberry, your host. And as always, I'd like to remind you to please like and subscribe. And this week we're joined from the US by Larry Rhodes, who is the founder of the Atheist Society of Knoxville. So thank you, Larry, for joining us and welcome oh, to the sure. show. Happy to be here. Yeah. So you are the founder of Ask, I understand. So yeah, that's, that's, that's right. I, I started it uh, right at 20 years ago, uh, just with a small ad in the newspaper. Um, I think the first time I showed up, nobody else did. Second time I showed up, one guy did. And uh, it kind of grew a little bit from there. We, we used to have monthly meetings. Uh, we would meet at a restaurant. Uh, and then I, I took uh, the idea from the Austin Atheist or Atheist Experience to meet at a pub. And uh, we started meeting there every week, and we've been doing that probably for 14 years, something like that. Okay, yeah, that's what our our atheist. Uh, we started it in a pub, and then as the, as we got too big for the pub, we we found another pub that had like an upstairs um, sort of room where we started doing hosting talks as well. But you know, still the drinking is good. So sure. All right. So uh, what? So what's it like there in Tennessee? I would I would imagine <clears throat> you're you're on the fringe of the Bible Belt, if not part of the Bible well, Belt? We're in the Bible Belt, for sure. But we, we live in a, a progressive town, uh, usually a, a Democratic uh, government, um, as opposed to Republican government. Uh, we, we're a college town. Um, our population in, in Knoxville grows by about half, again, when college is in session. And then when they break for the summer, it drops back down to a usual, like 200,000. I think, but um, it's a progressive town, liberal town, and we're really happy to be inside the city limits. Um, when you get out into the county and surrounding counties, it uh, the conservatism uh, spikes. It goes up and plateaus pretty high. Okay. So the, the fact that you're a college town, you've got a little bit more liberal and open-minded uh, mentality there. True. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You're probably not fighting then as much as you would out in in some of the more conservative neighborhoods. You're, no, no, you're and not matter, facing that. Okay. No, matter of fact, uh, over the last several years, I would go out and ha and personally host an a ask an atheist booth in various parks and downtown and on campus, and uh, got a pretty good reception there. Uh, a lot of people would walk by and give me a thumbs up, uh, tell me that they were already atheists. Uh, not not as many as I get the opposite reaction, but um, it's it, it, I wasn't ever in fear of my safety uh, in the in this area. Okay, and do, or do you coordinate sometimes with? Is, is there a student uh, group on campus for for non-belief as well? There is one that's called um, oh gosh, the citizen no secular student alliance. I'll get in a minute, um, and. I did try to coordinate with them maybe 10 years ago, uh, but it never really came to anything. Um, I don't know why. I guess they just didn't have much of an enthusiasm for activity. Uh, they were more for a, a social venue to be able to just not be alone on campus. But as far as outreach or act, uh, activism, uh, they weren't that interested in it. I see. Okay. And so you said 20 years ago, it was just one or two. So what are you guys up to now in terms of, of numbers? You said you're the city's about 200,000. Um, no, 1,000. 1,063 uh, uh, So at this point. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, two years ago, we went and changed in, from a private meetup club to a um, uh, what 401c3. I can't remember the exact but a nonprofit charity, group, registered charity, right? And we're doing work to help the homeless here in Knoxville. Okay, well, that's admirable. So it mm -hmm. certainly helps to fight that stigma that we're all amoral Satanists if, you, if sure. you're doing some humanist stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Right, any other programs you guys work on, or is it primarily just with the the homeless? Uh, primarily just with that. We do uh, support the the gay community, uh, the LBTQ. 
can't remember all of them, but uh, by marching with them when they have their local parade. Uh, COVID has kind of put a, a squash on that for the last couple of years. Uh, but of course, when it starts again, we'll be back there. We do still have uh, weekly public meetings uh, for ASK uh, downtown in the old city in, the, in uh, Barley's Taproom P Pizzeria every Tuesday evening. But uh, when COVID first hit, we, we had to kind of squash that for a year. But now everybody in the group pretty much is, is vaccinated. So we have uh, uh, less fear about getting infected when, we're, when we get together. Okay. So are your, your weekly meetups and it's just basically a social thing or do you, do you have yes. some speakers at times? Or? No, it's, it's like I say, just in a local restaurant slash bar. And uh, we just get together for, for camaraderie at those okay. meetings. All right. Yeah. Every, we also every have, society uh, kind of does it their own way. Right. We also have virtual meetings uh, at the same time while they're having their public meeting. Uh, we'll be having a, a virtual zoom meeting mainly because we started it during COVID because nobody wanted to get together out in public at that time. Uh, so we started Zoom meetings. And then once they started getting together in public again, we just kept it going because there are members that don't live in Knoxville and older members that don't want to get out in public uh, for fear of infection. So we do that every Tuesday night as well. Okay. Is I, I'm not that familiar with Knoxville, uh, and I presume we being an international organization. So, is is Knoxville close to other urban centers, or is it pretty isolated with uh, a, like the deep county? Well, the, the closest big city would be Chattanooga, and it's about a hundred miles away. Uh, we're a hundred and sixty miles, I think, from Nashville, and of course across the mountains from Asheville, North Carolina. So we're pretty isolated here, but. Okay. Um, we're happy. It's a very nice, um, like I say, liberal, happy community. So um, I've been living here myself since I went to college here, which was a while ago. So uh, <laughs> it's a very nice town. A lot of people love it here. Wait, so what's the school there? The University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, okay. The volunteers. Okay. All right. And so you do a, a weekly radio show as well. So can you maybe tell us uh, how you guys got started with that and, and how, what's the reception like? Not, not, not the <laughs> the reception of the community, not the reception. Sure. Of the no, uh, we, we don't get a whole lot of feedback from the community on it. Um, I actually, uh, well, let me tell you how it started. I was doing an Ask an Atheist booth downtown in, the, in Knoxville's uh, community centers area market square and uh this guy in a Sikh outfit if you can imagine you know turban beard all that walks up to me and i'm like oh boy <laughs> here we go but he he actually said uh, you are atheist i said yes he said how would you would you be interested in doing a radio show i said yes i've been trying to get on the local radio stations for a long time you know i have an atheist weekly broadcast or something and here is this guy just offering it to me on a plate but it turns out it's it's a small 100 watt low power fm radio station here in knoxville it's fully licensed by the fcc but uh, uh it doesn't have a huge reach it, its antenna is downtown so we reach the entire metropolitan area uh, and i do get an hour every week and wednesday nights to uh talk about atheism free thought rational thought and uh, sciences and religions so uh, we take so, advantage of that anyway this this Sikh uh was is turns out is still after five years still one of our biggest fans for the show uh he's very um uh, rational free thinker himself even though he has, you know, he has certain religious leanings so it's interesting that he he sought you out even though he's he's of a religious community so he hasn't okay. he hasn't uh Across to change teams yet? No, nope. so. no. Shout out to Brandon Singh. Okay. Well, it was nice of him to offer you that platform. So, did sure. did he ever give you any reason why he he wanted to give you that this that's that's well, slot? it's it's um, this radio station is a very liberal. Uh, some would say left leaning uh, radio station. It's like its symbol is like power to the people <laughs> type of thing. So uh, it wasn't really him who owned the station. Uh, matter of fact, it's owned by the DJs, theoretically. And I say that because there's one guy who's really set it up, got it going, and then kind of turned it over to the DJs. And he's still very active. Um, 
Chris uh, in the in the running of the station. But all the votes, every DJ has a full vote. Um, every new DJ has to be unanimously um, welcomed into the group or voted on to be into the group. But it, it's very democratic uh, process, and uh, I'm just happy to be to have been voted in. So. Okay. And so, what, what's the format of your show? Have you done any of something like the the atheist experience out of Austin? Like, do you have people call in and ask questions sometimes? Or well, we tried. We started that, uh, or I did. Uh, I was the sole DJ uh, for my show when it first started. I would have guests on and leave the and give out the phone number for the station. But we got so few fo- phone calls that after a while, we just didn't even bother giving out the numbers. I mean, I think we got total three calls in six months, something like that. So uh, at, this, at that point, once we uh, COVID hit and I didn't want to get out of the house much anymore, we started recording it. Uh, that is, Dr. Tyrone Wells and I started doing Zoom meetings and inviting other people to join us uh, in the, in the meetings. And those were the shows basically we record them every Sunday morning. And, uh, nowadays we have three to five or six people on the show every week from all around uh, Europe, from Europe and Canada and America. Okay. And so how do you, how do you pick your topics each week? Are you, are you looking for things that are in the news or just something somebody wants to talk about? Or? Um, both. But mainly, um, we're all on Facebook. Pretty much all of us are on Facebook. So we start, we have a chat group called Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. And uh, all of the DJs who have ever been on the show are in that group, uh, whether they're active or not. So uh, somebody will throw out a topic and we'll talk about it and we'll decide whether that's the one we want to do and then go with that. Okay. So there, uh, as some of our regular watchers might know, or if they're paying attention to the news that, you know, especially post Trump, you know, there's, there's a big evangelical push in the U S to control, you know, school boards with evolution. I, I, I was listening to your previous show with, with, with John, they were talking about Dover and mm-hmm. some of the, the, the right. of pandas and people. So do you, do you have a personal pet peeve that you, you, you try to fight or a topic that you, you're very much interested well, in? that's a that's a good one right there that you mentioned uh, religious encroachment into education of course it's it's been going on for quite a while um the first major um, legal battle was of course the the monkey trial of dayton tennessee which is only about 60 miles south of where we live here in knoxville um matter of fact uh george brown one of our regular people on the sh- on the broadcast lives within 20 miles i think of uh, Dayton, Tennessee. I've been there several times. They've got a little museum. The courthouse is still standing. Uh, It's in good condition and they have a museum downstairs if anybody wants to uh, visit it. But yeah, religious encroachment in schools and government is our our big thing. Yeah, it's been like about a hundred years now since the the Scopes Monkey trial as well. And here we are still fighting the same battle. Uh, It was 1925, I think it was. And uh, we're coming up on that mom arc interesting yeah so anybody who doesn't know it uh, if you're if you're too lazy to read up on it there's a great movie called inherit the wind that's based mm-hmm. on the smoky trial watch the movie it's it's mm-hmm. quite interesting I've, I've i've done some some research on it it's um i've got some great quotes from clarence darrow from the the trial transcripts that i, sure. I really love yeah. so okay yeah, no there's been several versions of it made and i think uh, jack nicholson was in one of them uh, but of course, the most popular one was the one with Mr. Tracy, and um, I can't think of the other actor, but uh, Spencer Tracy did a really good job in it. Yeah. Okay, so, are, are there any issues lately in Tennessee on this, or the the, the encroachment has kind of died down a little bit because they they lose every battle? Well, the the biggest problem in Tennessee, I would think, and in the South and the country as a whole, is this voucher program. Every dollar that goes into a voucher comes out of the uh, education system. Uh, in other words, if you, let's, let's say your, your family uses $200 in the vouchers to get send your kids to a religious school or homeschool them, well, that's $200 that your local school system does not get. So that, that's a big problem and uh, it seems to be growing depending on, you know, because our government here in Tennessee, the, the state government all is Republican and pretty staunchly so. 
we have pockets like Knoxville and Chattanooga that are pretty Democrat and liberal, but the, the state is, as a whole goes with the rest of the South, unfortunately. So I'm not familiar with this voucher program, nor would nor would our non-American viewers. Can you maybe just give us a little background on what that is? Well, um, with the Freedom From Religion um, movement or act or whatever you want to call it, um, they allow you, person, if they don't want to sign up for public education, let's say they want to homeschool or send their school, their kids to a religious school, like a Catholic school or something like that, usually the government would not support the religion in a way you know, directly pay religion to keep their schools running. They depend on donations and um, tithing things to keep them open. But with this um, movement to for the voucher program is that the government can give you, if you don't want to send your kids to, to educational uh, institution, the government uh, school system, they'll give you the money that your kid would normally have spent in that system or they would have spent on you in that system so that you could then take it to a private school or a STEM school, which is not a bad idea altogether, uh, except that it robs the education system, the government, the regular education system in America. But now they have allowed them to use those vouchers in religious schools as well, which is a indirect funding of religion by the government, which is disallowed by the, by the American constitution. Okay, but so is that, a, is that a recent change that they started to allow to be funding to I go would say it's schools? recent. It's been going on for quite a few years. I, I don't really know how many. Um, but one of the other major problems that I have with, uh, with government giving religions money is the faith-based initiative started by uh, George W. Bush um, back, what, two presidencies ago? He, he used an executive order to bypass the legal system and, and set up this faith-based charity system where governments can give um, churches and, and religious schools or hospitals direct infusions of cash, which is illegal by the Constitution. We're not supposed to do that. No direct money from government to religions. But with this uh, executive order, it's allowed. Uh, and what really kills me is, well, you figured that um, Trump would not do anything about it, and he didn't. But um, here we got Biden in office, and he's still letting it slide. He's still letting it go. Matter of fact, all during the eight years of the Obama administration, he let it go. This is an executive order. It can be stopped at any time by the sitting president. Nope. They're still allowing it to happen. Your tax dollars going directly to churches. So presumably it's because they, they've used the word faith based that they would well, apply to every religion, but it's probably yeah, a backdoor yeah, into. Yeah, I think this all stems from 9-11 when there was an emergency, a uh, national emergency. We were attacked and the churches were, of course, l lending a hand, uh, especially the big churches like uh, Liberal University, uh, Liberty University and other large religious organizations were giving hands. So they passed a bill to be able to give money directly to the churches so that they could then use that for charity work and help the, the, the people who are affected by emergencies. But of course, it's, it's gone a lot farther than that now. It's like, um, you know, if there's a big hurricane or earthquake, we give money to the churches, they help the people in that area, but they pocket a substantial portion of that for their own coffers is how it works out. That seems a little bit sleazy. Yes. Okay. So uh, has anybody bothered to do a, a, a reconciliation or some accounting on this to see like, you know, are, are there Hindu groups and, groups and Muslim Generally, groups getting? The IRS is, is generally a hands off where it comes to religion in America. It's, it's, I'd like to say it's surprising, but it's really not surprising. It's, it's egregious. I mean, they, they take a fine tooth comb and a magnifying glass to every other institution to make sure they get the last dollar that they can from them and individuals for that matter. But when it comes to churches, eh, you know, they're churches, let them go. We, you know, we don't want to inter interfere with religious freedom which is the catch word nowadays, catch phrase that protects everything. Interesting. So, yeah, I hadn't heard about this and I'm, I'm not American, so I hadn't mm -hmm. heard about 
about your system. So interesting. So all right. Any any other um, major hot button topics you guys are you're interested in or you'd like to talk about on your show? Well, we talk about science a lot and how it, how it contradicts the uh, teachings of the Bibles. Of course, you know, the age of the earth, uh, where we came from, um, evolution and, and morality. Uh, one of the biggest false claims of, uh, of the religious people is that you got to have religion uh, to be moral. And we, we like to take that to task pretty well on the show, have had several shows about morality and where it comes from and why uh, obedience, per se, is not morality. Uh, I mean, doing what it says you have to do in the Bible is, is you know, you may consider it good and fine and all well, but it's not morality. Morality is, is finding the best, best path forward in a difficult moral situation, ethical situation. Uh, you know, least harm, uh, most uh, benefit, that type of thing. And just simply following rules is that. Right. Yeah, I was reading uh, on your blog as well. You had an article on uh, tricks of the apologists. And oh, yeah. it's one of the things I've, I've come across myself as well, that the the way that they like to argue that the uh, one of the, the, the things I've noticed is mostly with I've seen it with some of the more well-educated ones. Like I, I was debating a Baptist pastor uh, who was doing a master's degree in history from a an evangelical Bible college. So his education, let's say, is sorely lacking in in uh, the right, sciences, right? not just the sciences, but in in credibility. Oh, um, yeah. And one of the things I, I noticed with another apologist in in the last year who was he was employing the same tactic as this Baptist pastor. And I, I started making me wonder if this is something that they're taught. Uh, you had mentioned that, they, you know, they're in your article that they're, they're basically reading off a script and, and the best way to knock them off their feet is to get them off the script. Um, and so what I've noticed that they'll do is they'll, they'll pick sort of an obscure passage in the Bible or some topic and they'll, they'll throw out some, pseudo academic, you know, scholarly wording around it. Uh, they say, oh yeah, the scholars will support this, but they won't know, they won't name the scholars that, you know, they're talking about, or they'll just say the majority of scholars and it'll turn out it'll be a, a bunch of uh, Bible college people or uh, the liberal evangelicals. Uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll sort of wrap it in, in jargon to make it sound intelligent, but they won't actually back it up with anything. And then, if, you know, if you start to dig a little bit, you know, you'll find like, you know, legitimate biblical scholars, you know, aren't saying anything uh, of, of the kind. So it, it does seem to be that the there are tricks that they are liking to employ, like, you know, the, the arguments, the, the, the logical fallacies that they employ that you were you were listing in your uh, in your article. Right. So, have you ever have you ever been in any of these debates? Have you have you done a show where you've debated, or you've done an event where you've debated uh, the other uh, side? Well, like I said, I do my ask an atheist booth sometimes with other atheists, but mostly just by myself, sitting on a a park bench or a, um, a little table downtown in the Market Square, uh, you know, with a sign saying "Ask an Atheist," let people come up and just talk to me. So, I've had my share of arguments. Um, but one of them, one of my real pet peeves about their tactics, as it were, is obfuscation. Um, for those who may not know, it's it's clouding the subject. Like you'll say, um, you know, I don't know uh, that any miracles have ever happened. You know, we can't believe that miracles in in the book you know, happen because there's just stories. And he'll say, well, how can we know anything? I mean, how can I even know that you're sitting there? You know, they they will literally throw knowledge and education out the window just to throw a big question mark on your argument um i mean if we can't know anything then how do we know that the bible is real i mean it may not even be real at all any more real than i'm not sitting here as you know they would say but it's just moving the goalposts you know you'll ask them a question and, and pin them to, and they'll give you an answer and you'll pin them down on that answer and then of course as soon as they take a breath they move to something else hoping that you won't notice that they fail to answer it or answered it incorrectly. Yeah. So there's a lot of tactics and, uh, yeah, you know, the circular, circular reasoning, circular reasoning yeah. seems to be there. Oh yeah. The there, big one, big circular out. reasoning is pointing to the Bible to prove that the Bible is real or true. You know, the Bible 
doesn't prove your claim. It is the claim. Yeah. You're just repeating the claim. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're not uh, necessarily educated in, in logical fallacies and philosophy and, and how to argue. So it's just bait and switch. Mm -hmm. True. There's a great quote from the, the old show, uh, House. It says, rationality doesn't work on religious people. Otherwise, there wouldn't be religious people. And I always take ex an exemption for that. I take um, I have a problem with that because... Were you religious? Were you ever religious yourself? Yeah, I, I grew up in a moderate uh, Protestant church in Canada until I went uh, to university. I, I grew up in a Southern Baptist. So we were religious at one time. We were literally logically argued out of our position. But rational, rational argument and logic does work on religious people. You know, if they, if they take the time to think about it and credit... Uh, logic for what it and re reason logic and reason for what it actually does then they can be argued out of their position it happens every day it's, i wouldn't say it's the majority i would i would think that's probably a, a very small minority who can be argued out of those positions the ones who are at least um, being actually honest about it yes yes but, I, I certainly wouldn't say all but yeah it can happen and it does happen yeah yeah i had my my conversion not for me but a my a religious person that i converted and i wasn't trying to mm -hmm. um she was just talking to me that she had been she had grown up catholic and she'd been to a mormon church and an evangelical church and she's just been bouncing around looking for answers and i just said, well it's because you can't get the right answer because you're not asking the right question um so you got to start from the premise you know that they're the their premise is faulty and they're, they're starting from there and building this house of cards on top of it. And you just look at that. The question is wrong. And that's when the light, like, the light bulb went off for her. And she's like, you're the first person that ever made sense to me. No, oh, well, very good. Very good. Let's see right there. That's a good example. Yeah. But mm -hmm. she was, I guess she was in a position where she was willing and ready to listen. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, you were probably <laughs> debated as many as I have where they just, they're not willing to listen. Right. That they're obfuscating. There, so. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, uh, when the student is ready, a teacher will appear. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. That's very good. Yeah, the similar one I like is uh, the master has failed more than the novice has tried. Mm -hmm. so, so experience is a good teacher. So, yep. Okay. Yep. But All again, right, so, a lot of it is the position that the, the mental position of the student, whether they're ready yeah. to hear it or not. Yeah. And like when I when I was still a Christian, I wasn't I was not ready to listen at those times. You know, mm -hmm. I accepted like the story of Noah at face value, without, you know, yeah. critically thinking about like how we're it's basically mm -hmm. genocide. So, well, you're young enough to have met several atheists growing up or at least non-believers or people of other religions. I grew up in a small town in West Tennessee in the 1950s and uh there there wasn't many people that you could meet that would challenge your your ideas on the subject uh yeah. most most people from your parents to the postman to the mayor to the president all were believers and all of them were authority figures so yeah. you know back then it, um, i'm, I'm older did. than i look i grew i grew up in the yeah. 70s so i'm quite a bit older than i look so. uh -huh. I, I've but been they, watching uh, during COVID. I've been watching, binge watching some old shows from the like fifties and sixties and seventies, and I'm, I'm kind of gobsmacked at the the amount of God that's in some of these shows. Oh, oh yeah, and, mm -hmm. and and the movies. You got to think about like the Ten Commandments movie, which is strictly a religious propagation or propaganda yeah. movie, and there were several that were made Ben Hur and all that 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 rallied around the Christian cause. Yeah. Well, it seems to be dying out. So. Yep. The internet where religions go to die. Yeah, well, that's the thing with the information age. The, mm -hmm. the kids today are tech savvy. They can look stuff up and, hey, this is crap, you know. And mm -hmm. So wow. I, I'm often amazed that, you know, I, I've met some ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and, and in particularly uh, ex-Mormons who never never knew that Joseph Smith was a convicted fraud. So, right. like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's getting harder and harder to to hide that kind of stuff mm -hmm. in, the, in the information age. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show this week and telling us what you're doing. Um, sure. You're saying you're helping the homeless and supporting LGBTQ rights. So mm -hmm. it's admirable and we, we need to see more of that. Uh, we'd like to see, I, I'm always interested to hear when I'm talking to local groups on, on what they're doing and the advocacy they're doing, because I think that goes a long way to fighting the stigma that we're, we're evil and immoral people that show that we're just humanists and we're helping everybody without the promise of reward. So. Right. I'm glad to hear that uh, what you guys are up to and the maybe right word in a better world <laughs> yeah maybe one of these days when COVID is done I'll, I'll swing through tennessee i don't think i've been through tennessee since 79 when i was driving to florida <laughs> so it's been a long time well, since i've been we're there. right on the route in knoxville is anyway and before cool. we go let me blog um plug my blog it's digital free, free thought radio hour slash well digital free thought dot com slash blog i'll put it that way and okay. just look up digital free thought and you'll find us. We'll put the book and we will put the link in the description. So just take a look. It'll be there. So okay. sounds real good. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Larry, for joining us. And if you're in the Knoxville area, please look up the Atheist Society of Knoxville and join them for uh, an evening of drinks and, and, and food at the pizza parlor. And, two, and as two always, evenings. Mm -hmm. two evenings. All right. As always, please remember to like and subscribe and we'll see everybody next week. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Nice to meet you, Jason. Take care. Thank you, Larry. Okay, thanks for listening and don't forget we're on YouTube, so follow us on YouTube, just search for Atheist Alliance International and please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're also on all of your favourite podcast platforms, so make sure that you follow us on there as well. See you next time. Thank you.